you have questions, the Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Phillips Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to a Bible answer. This program is brought to you by the good elders of the Phillips Street Church of Christ in Dyersburg, Tennessee, and 30 faithful congregations of the Churches of Christ in your area. At the close of our program today, you'll see them listed. We invite you to worship with them whenever you might have the opportunity. We have three good gospel preachers with us to answer your questions. We'll have them introduce themselves to you at this time. I'm Curtis Cates, and I'm Director Emeritus of the Memphis School of Preaching. I'm Gary Colley, preacher for the Getwell Church of Christ in Memphis, Tennessee, and also one of the teachers for Memphis School of Preaching. I'm Garland Elkins. I preach for the Stanton Church of Christ and teach in the Memphis School of Preaching. We're grateful to each of these <coughs> brethren for being with us today to answer your questions. Now, our first question today goes to Brother Cates. Brother Cates, the query says, May the church help those in need who are not Christians from funds, with funds from the church. We'll give that to you, Brother Cates. Well, thank you. The heart of Christianity is to do good to others. In fact, uh, Acts 10, 38 states that Christ went about doing good. And so the question amounts to this. May the beautiful bride of Christ, the church, do what the bridegroom, Christ, did when he was on earth. May the church help both people of God and those who are not people of God. May the church help both saints and non-saints as well as the children of non-saints out of the church treasury. Now, oddly enough, some say we cannot help non-saints out of their, the treasury or their children. Uh, one preacher in debate worded it like this. It is a sin to take money out of the church treasury to help a destitute, hungry child, and those who do so will go to hell. In other words, if a starving baby is left on the steps of the church building, the brethren may not take a dime out of the treasury to buy milk to feed this starving baby if the baby is a child of a non-saint. Now, please remember that uh, they will say that the church may, with God's blessing, uh, buy fertilizer to feed the lawn of the preacher, but uh, they cannot help, we cannot help a starving baby out of the church treasury. Now, is that what the Bible teaches? In Galatians 6.10, we're commanded, do good unto all men, and especially those who are of the household of faith. Well, all men include those who are not of the household of faith. Now, he's writing to the churches in Galatia. In fact, the churches in Macedonia and in Achaia did just exactly that. I want you to notice 2 Corinthians 9, verses 12 and 13 where the Apostle Paul spoke of their having met the needs of the needy saints. And he also noted that those saints would pray to God and thank God for their, quote, liberal distribution unto them, that is, the saints, and unto all men. Verse 12. Now, was Paul uh, redundant here? Did he say that they thank God for the liberal distribution of the church unto the saints and unto all the saints? No, that's redundant. And so he stated that they help both saints and non-saints. Now, if they helped out of the treasury saints and non-saints, then we can do the same thing today. Thank you, Brother Cates, for that good answer. answer. Our next question to Brother Colley. Brother Colley, who supported the families of Jesus' disciples when they followed him? Brother Colley. Well, I can understand the question because it seems that Jesus simply said to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and others, 
Come and follow me, and I'll make thee fishers of men. And who was that to take care of their family after they were away? Well, the truth of the matter is, each husband has to take care of his family, each father. And that is something that is a responsibility which nobody can remove. You remember Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 5, Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas, or Peter? Of course, there are many who claim that Peter was not married. But you know it is seen in the Scriptures that he was married. Matthew 8, 14 we find that when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid sick with a fever. And he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she arose and ministered unto him. Now certainly she, he was married because he had a mother-in-law. And I, somebody said, no, they wouldn't be married if they didn't have, or they wouldn't have a mother-in-law if they weren't married for sure. But Paul says, we have the right, the power to lead about a wife as the other apostles the brethren of the Lord, and Cephas. It is also said in 1 Timothy 3, 1 and 2, that an elder of the church is to have one wife. It's very important for preachers and elders to have wives, and they're to take care of those wives. In fact, we must provide for our family. You remember 1 Timothy 5, 8, but if any man provide not for his own, and especially them of his own household, he hath denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel. I believe in these last years we've had some people wink at some passages in the Bible. They seem to have the Passover of them. You know, in 1 Timothy 5, 3 and 4, 3 and 4 he said, Honor widows that are widows indeed. He's talking to Timothy, the young preacher, and also the church which he worked with. But he said, If any widow have children or nephews, let them first show, learn to show piety at home and requite their parents or repay them. For that is good and acceptable before God. But now, watch verse 16. If any man or woman that believeth hath widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged, that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. And so these had a responsibility to their family as long as they had someone to take care of them. But widows indeed were 60 years old, didn't have children or grandchildren that could support them. You know, in James 1, 27, he says, Now pure religion, undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Yes, these men, like all today, are responsible for their families. Thank you, Brother Colley. And now to Brother Elkins. Brother Elkins, we have this question for you. The Sabbath day is the seventh day and on Saturday. So why do we go to church on Sunday, Brother Elkins? Well, that is an excellent question. A lot of people uh, misunderstand, do not understand the right division of the word here. Uh, first of all, the seventh day was the Sabbath day, and the Jews were supposed to keep it. But Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were not told to do so. In Deuteronomy 5, it is said, and Moses, of course, had gone up to the mountain to get the Ten Commandment law. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. He made not this covenant with our fathers. Well, their ancestors were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and others. But with us, even with us, who are all here alive this day. Now, how long was this uh, Ten Commandment law and the Sabbath was a part of it to remain? Well, it remained till Christ died on the cross. In Colossians 2.14, what happened to the law? Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, what did he do with it? And took it out of the way, nailing to his cross. In 2 Corinthians 3, we have four different passages and three different expressions, or three different passages and four different expressions about the Ten Commandment law. You remember when Moses brought the Ten Commandment law down from Mount Sinai? And his face was shining, and the people were afraid, asked him to put a veil over his face. Well, in 2 Corinthians 3.11, it says that which he brought down, which was the Ten Commandment law contained in the Sabbath, that it is done away. And then it also is said in the next verse that it is abolished. And then again it is said it is done away. 
And then in verse 14, it is pointed out that when the law of Moses is read, that there's a veil upon their eyes. The law of Moses is no longer binding. But why upon the first day of the week do we meet? Mark 16, 9, now when Jesus was risen early on the first day of the week, he appeared first unto Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. That was the first day of the week. But we find that Christians are to meet upon the first day of the week. In Acts 20 and verse 7, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech unto midnight. And of course, they met on the first day of the week, but we give on the first day of the week. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. And the church came together to do that. I wish I had more time, but thank you much for the question. Thank you, Brother Elkins. We've reached the halfway point of our program today. We want to offer to you a free tract. Our track today is entitled, The New Birth. This is a great track written by Brother Perry B. Cotham. If you'd like this free track, or if you'd like to take our eight lesson Bible correspondence course in the privacy of your home, just request the track entitled, The New Birth, or our correspondence course, or both. You may contact us at Phillip Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillip Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You may email us and note our new email address, a Bible answer at earthlink.net. That's a Bible answer at earthlink.net. Or you may call our toll free number at 1 800 436 0463. And we hope to hear from you very soon. Our next question today goes to Brother Curtis Cates. Brother Cates, our children conceived in sin and lost, and the reference they give is Psalm 51 and verse 5. Brother Cates. Okay. Let us notice uh, Psalm 51 verse 5. David said, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, in order to understand the question, one must uh, go back and understand some about Augustinianism, uh, 1,700 years ago, this doctrine was begun, continued by, uh, picked up by John Calvin later on, the doctrine of hereditary total depravity. Now, the doctrine goes something like this. God chose to test the whole, whole human race in our father, Adam. So in the garden, in testing Adam and telling him not to do, uh, uh, do certain things like eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God was testing all of us in Adam. We had nothing to do with it, but we all were tested. And so when Adam sinned, then that total depravity, quote, uh, moved down, was given from ancestor to ancestor on down to each of us. Consequently, when a little child is conceived in the womb, is conceived, then that child is immediately totally depraved, holy inclined to do evil. Now that is Augustinianism, Calvinism, but it's not Bible. Now what does the Bible teach? Bible teaches the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, nor the father of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. The wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Ezekiel 18, 20. My friends, little children are conceived and are born into this world purer and whiter than the driven snow. In fact, Christ said, Suffer the little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such are the kingdom of God. Matthew 18, 3. And uh, Matthew 19, 14. Except you turn and become as little children, you can in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. Now, what about Psalm 51, 5? David did not affirm that he was born in sin. He said, in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, some people say, well, that means that we are conceived into a world that is characterized a lot of times by wickedness. It is my contention that that goes back to the sin ten generations before between Judah and Tamar. And it is interesting 
that David was thinking about that. And it is also interesting that David was the first generation who could enter in the assembly. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 23, 1 and 2. An illegitimate child could not enter into the assembly. And so he rejoiced that he could do that. Thank you, Brother Cates, for that good answer. Our next question goes to Brother Gary Colley. Brother Colley, what about hand clapping in worship, Brother Colley? Well, I'm sure this is a widely question of interest, and we appreciate the one who has asked it today. I believe that the Bible teaches that hand clapping is out of place and out of order in New Testament worship. You know, worship is a time of sacredness, of kissing the hand toward God. It is a time of meditation and reverence toward God. And of course, we see Paul's command in 1 Corinthians 14, 40, let all things be done decently and in order. Also, we see that worship is not a performance for the audience, but it is a performance for God. We are worshiping Him, not those that are about us hearing us sing or hearing our prayer or hearing the teaching. We're worshiping God. And it should be a thing where we do not stomp and romp and weave and, and clap in order that we might uh, show our approval of someone and some of their talent. We're not trying to please the audience when we serve in the kingdom, but we're trying to please God and uphold His will for all men. In John 4, 24, He says, God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Clapping, my friends, I contend, is that which shall disrupt the dignity and the solemnity of worship. And it is all right at a ball game. It's all right at the theater, the show, but not in worship unto God. I spoke in an Arkansas town a few months ago, and after I spoke, we had a baptism. And at that baptism, after it was all over, they began to clap in the audience. I had ridden over there with one of the elders, and so on the way back, I asked him, I said to this, is this something they practice often, clapping when someone is baptized? And he said, I'm afraid so. I said, do you suppose that they would have clapped at the cross? Because baptism is a reenaction of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 3, Romans 6, verse 3 and 4, and 16 through 18. Heaven, my friends, does not authorize clapping in worship. Galatians 1, 6 through 9, Paul marveled that they were so removed so soon from the grace of God unto another gospel. Sometimes we see people who are removed from the solemnity and seriousness of worship to even go so far as to clap. I believe that's out of order and out of place in worship. Thank you, Brother Colley. To Brother Elkins, we have this question. Does the Bible make a distinction between Israel and the church, Brother Elkins? Yes, it definitely does. The people of Israel uh, were a nation. The people was a nation in the Old Testament. When Jacob's name was changed from Jacob to Israel, meaning Prince of God, then his descendants began to be known as Israelites. And of course, that nation was destroyed by the Romans in AD 70. Now the church of our Lord is that spiritual institution, the spiritual body of Christ. Christ said in Matthew 16, 18 to Peter, and I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Notice he just said one, I will build my church, and the gates of hell or Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom, whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. They are separate institutions. But now, even though Israel as a nation no longer exists with God's authority as they're His special people, we as Christians are spiritual descendants of Abraham. The Bible says, now if you're Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise in Galatians 3. And in Galatians 1, 1 and 2, the letters addressed to the churches of Galatia, but in Galatians 6, 15 and 16, he said, But as many as walk according to this, well, he said, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision 
availeth anything nor uncircumcision. That is, whether you are a physical Jew or a physical Gentile, doesn't change anything. You're on the same level. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Well, how do you become a new creature? You're born of water and the Spirit, John 3, 5. Or in more literal language, Christ, Christ said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, in the next verse it says, But as many as walk by this rule, what rule? Being, being Jew or Gentile doesn't, we're on the same level. But being a new creature, being a Christian does. But as many as walk by this rule, peace be upon them and mercy upon the Israel of God. And in Romans 2, 28 and 29, it points out he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. The nation of Israel does not exist today by God's authority to his people. They lost that right. But the church of our Lord will exist to the end of time. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, 23, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for it. In verse 25, verse 23, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Thank you for that good question. Thank you, Brother Elkins. We're having some great questions today, and we appreciate them so much and these good answers that are being given. Our next question today goes to Brother Cates. Brother Cates, this is an interesting question, I think. Is James 5, 3 in error, the person says, because gold cannot rust. We'll give that to you, Brother Cates. Thank you very much for this good question. You know, sometimes we use language that may be, say, accommodative language and so forth. We know that our earth is rotating, but actually we talk about the sun rising in the east in the morning. Well, in a sense, it does. Now, James stated, your gold and your silver are rusty. And their rust shall be a witness or a testimony against you, and shall eat your flesh as fire. Now James in verse 2 had referred to their riches, and then he lists some specific examples, such as garments that are moth-eaten, <coughs> uh, gold, silver. Now it is indeed true that rust and si or gold and silver do not rust. It seems logical then that James is speaking figuratively. What James is seeking to do is to describe how our wealth, when we don't use it to the glory of the Lord and we don't help others, when we hoard it up and so forth, uh, it may be moth-eaten or corrupt or rot or canker. Of course, uh, not all of the rich would allow their wealth to literally be moth-eaten or to canker. But the figurative language is the same. Do not allow your wealth to testify against you come judgment day. Now, the last of verse 3 shows that the language is figurative. When the Bible says, It shall eat your flesh as fire, that is, the gold and silver. Well, this meaning simply is that one's hoarded up unused wealth in the judgment shall bring destruction. And we could learn many lessons from the rich farmer in Luke 12, 13 to 34, and other passages. Let us lay ourselves up treasures in heaven where rust does not destroy. Thank you, Brother Cates. We want to thank these brethren for doing such a great job today in answering your questions. We've had some great answers. And we've had some uh, great questions sent in by our viewers. That's really the backbone of a Bible answer, these wonderful questions that are sent in. And we want to encourage you to send these questions in. Again, at the end of our program today, you'll see our contact information where you can write us, call us, or email us your Bible question. And we'll seek to answer it on a future program of a Bible answer. We have a number of supporting congregations of a Bible answer, and you'll see their names in just a moment. They are the Bishop Street Church of Christ in Union City, Tennessee, the Bradford Church of Christ in Bradford, Tennessee, the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri, where I labor, the Dexter Church of Christ in Dexter, Missouri, the Doris Chapel Church of Christ in Trenton, Tennessee, 
the Fairview Church of Christ in Milan, Tennessee, the Fremont Church of Christ, that's near Union City, Tennessee, the Gardner Church of Christ near Martin, Tennessee, the Gideon Church of Christ in Gideon, Missouri, the Greenfield Church of Christ in Greenfield, Tennessee, the Locust Grove Church of Christ near Bradford, Tennessee, the Main Street Church of Christ in Troy, Tennessee, the Marion Church of Christ in Marion, Illinois, the Matthews Church of Christ in Matthews, Missouri, the Mounds Church of Christ in Mounds, Illinois, the Mount Zion Church of Christ near Hornbeak, Tennessee, the Nance Church of Christ near Alamo, Tennessee, the Neboville Church of Christ, that's near Yorkville, Tennessee, the New Johnsonville Church of Christ in New Johnsonville, Tennessee, the Palmersville Church of Christ in Palmersville, Tennessee, the Phillips Street Church of Christ in Dyersburg, Tennessee, which is our overseeing congregation, the Pleasant Hill Church of Christ in Trenton, Tennessee, the Portageville Church of Christ in Portageville, Missouri, the Ripley Church of Christ in Ripley, Tennessee, the Samford Church of Christ in Steele, Missouri, the Sharon Church of Christ in Sharon, Tennessee, the Spring Creek Church of Christ in Hickory, Kentucky, the Troy Road Church of Christ in O'Brien, Tennessee, the Yorkville Church of Christ in Yorkville, Tennessee, and the Whitlock Church of Christ, that's near Paris, Tennessee. 30 congregations in all, without them, a Bible answer could not be brought to you. What's your attitude today toward the Bible? Do you believe it's just a good book to read when you are sick or maybe when you are dying? Do you just use it to prove that you're right in some religious argument? Or perhaps you're one of those people who only use it to preserve your wedding and birth announcements. Well, friends, the Bible is God's Word, and it contains the things that God wants us to know and to do. It's a book by which to live. It thoroughly furnishes us unto every good work, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. In other words, everything we need to know and do in order to be saved is revealed in the Word of God. Obviously, then, we need to be students of the Bible. We don't need just to own it. We need to study it. I want to encourage you today to study the Word of God, and if you have a question, please send it in. For remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for A Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with a faithful Church of Christ in your area. Yes. You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Phillips Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, 
Here is your moderator. Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to a Bible Answer. My name is Mike McDaniel, and I'm the evangelist of the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. Thank you for watching a Bible Answer today. This program is dedicated to answering Bible questions from you, our viewers. At the halfway point of our program, and again at the end, you'll see our contact information where you may send us your Bible question, and we'll seek to answer it on a future program of a Bible Answer. We have three guest gospel preachers with us to answer your questions. We'll have them introduce themselves to you once again. Well, I'm Curtis Cates, and I'm uh, the Director Emeritus of the Memphis School of Preaching. 